let's look at another um, example of hypothesis testing. Here I have a machine in a student lounge that dispenses coffee. The average cup of coffee is supposed to contain seven ounces. There are 32 cups of coffee from this machine and it shows that the average is 7.3 ounces for that sample with a sample standard deviation of 0.5 ounces. The question here says, test the claim that the average amount of coffee per cup is different from seven ounces. Use a 5% level of significance. Now, one of the first things that you need to work on when you're working with the different types of questions and statistics in this portion of a course is there's confidence intervals that are done, there's probabilities that are done, there are sample size questions, and there are hypothesis test questions that all happen about the same time. So the very first thing you need to look at is what is the question specifically asking you to do so that you can concentrate your thought process on that category of the type of problem. Well here it says test the claim that the average amount of coffee per cup is different from seven ounces. So I'm to test a claim. So I know I'm at least in the hypothesis test portion of the idea. Now once we're working with hypothesis tests, a lot of times we do hypothesis tests where we're comparing one sample towards a value that we have previous information about or whether I've sampled from two different groups and I'm trying to use the sampling from the two different groups to compare the population parameters. Here, I just took one sample of 32 cups of coffee from that particular machine. So I have a one sample sort of situation with my hypothesis test. The next determination I need to think about is well, what parameter are they wanting me to do the hypothesis test about? Because they might ask me for a hypothesis test concerning a proportion or a hypothesis test concerning a mean, or a hypothesis test concerning a variance or standard deviation. So next I look really carefully to see that it says test the claim that the average amount of coffee per cup is different than seven ounces. So testing the claim about the average is testing the claim about a population mean. Now within the category of a population mean, I still have one more decision to make before I can get everything set up. And that is, when we're doing hypothesis tests concerning the mean, our distribution will be a normal distribution in certain circumstances when we do this test, or a student's t distribution in other circumstances. The old way of thinking about it was purely on the sample size. If my sample size was n greater than or equal to 30, um, then I would use my z distribution. Or if I had a smaller sample size, but I knew I was pulling from a normal distribution, I could use that. Now, we look at if I have not any information particularly knowing that I'm pulling from a normal distribution, but I only know the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation when I'm doing a hypothesis test concerning the mean, then I'm supposed to use the student's t distribution for this test. Had I had the population standard deviation in the setup of the problem and doing a hypothesis test concerning the mean, that's when I would use my standard normal distribution if I didn't know that the original distribution was normal. So a lot of decisions to make. But we looked, it's a hypothesis test, it's a hypothesis test concerning the average, the mean, and I only know the sample standard deviation, not the population standard deviation. So we'll use the student's t-distribution for this test. Now the first component we need to write down is our null and our alternate hypothesis. The parameter that we're talking about is the average, and the symbol for the population mean is mu. So make sure you use the correct parameter notation when you're setting up your null and alternate hypothesis. In the null, I set it equal to whatever the referencing thing is that I'm supposed to test it against. And test it that it's different from the 7 ounces. So I go equals 7 for my mu equals 7 for my null hypothesis. And then my alternate is that mu is, when it says different from, that's not equal to my 7. And remember, your alternate hypothesis comes often from the wording of what they asked you to test. Um, if it says less than, I use a less than. If it says greater than, I use a greater than. If it says different from, or is not equal to, or any sort of that vocabulary, that's when I need to do the not equal to.
Now the next thing is, the alternate hypothesis tells you what kind of a tail test you're doing. And when it's a not equal to, it's a two tail test. That we have for our example. Now we're going to solve this using our traditional hypothesis testing method. So once I have the null and alternate hypothesis down, the next thing I do, so I'll do that as step one. The second step that I do is we want to sketch our curve. And mark the critical values. So we're going to sketch our curve and mark the critical values. Now it's student's t distribution, so we will draw a symmetrical distribution. Remember with the student's t distribution, that particular distribution had a mean that was zero with positive numbers to the right and negative numbers to the left. Our critical values are in the tails, are at the cutoff of the tails where we say it's far enough into the tail that we have significant information from our data to say that truly the parameter is probably from a distribution other than this one. And in my tails, I have my 5%, my level of significance. So 5% is shared between the tails, so that gives me a 0 0.025 in each of the tails, so that combined it will have the 5% level of significance there. Now remember with the student's T distribution, you have degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom in the application where we're just pulling from one sample is that our degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. In this case, our n is how many cups of coffee we sampled, and we sampled 32 cups of coffee. So our n is 32. So our degrees of freedom is equal to 32 subtract 1, or 31. Now your t distribution is organized where very possibly in the top heading part, it'll say area in one tail and have some markings, and then area in two tails. So if you're looking under the heading of area in one tail, you would use the 0.025 um, because that's what's in each tail. If you're looking under the he heading in area in two tails, you'd use the overall 0.05 because this is a two-tail test and combined it's 0.05. But you'll notice that those are the headings that are above the exact same column. So you come down underneath that heading and across from 31 and you'll see the value 2.040 on the student's t-distribution. And student's t distribution, along with the standard normal distribution, are symmetrical about the mean, with the positive numbers to the right of your mean and the negative numbers to the left of your mean of zero for the standardized one. So we'll have a positive 2.040 at that cutoff and a negative 2.040 at this left tail cutoff. So those are the values that are our deal breakers in terms of when we compare our test statistic. So notice we haven't done anything with the sample information so far except look at the sample size n equal 32 when we were trying to get our degrees of freedom. Next is where we start using our sample information and we get that to figure out our test statistic. And our test statistic for this example is t is equal to the number we're changing, and the number we're changing is from the sample information, our 7.3 ounces that we got from our sample, minus the mean of the distribution we're testing it against. And the mean of the distribution we're testing it against is our 7 ounces. All over S, our sample um, standard deviation, the 0 0.5 divided by the square root of n, and the square root of n here is the square root of 32. Now grab your numerator and denominators in parentheses so that you get the right value when you calculate this out. So our t 
when you calculate out the 7.3 minus the 7 and divide it by, open a parenthesis on your calculator, 0 0.5 divide by the square root of 32 and close, it is equal to 3.394. when you divide that up. Next up, we place that critical value, or that test statistic, excuse me, we place that test statistic along this number line on the bottom of the curve. Test statistics and critical values are on the number line. Now numerically, 3.394 is further to the left on the number line than the 2.040. And so when I place my test statistic, I see it's more to the extreme of the tail. It's underneath the shaded region. So that's showing me that it's far enough away from the middle that it probably has a distribution different than the one that we were testing it against. So since it's under the shaded region, the critical value is, um, the test statistic is underneath the shaded region, we have that we will reject the null, h sub zero, at the 5% level of significance. So what that means is that when we come back and we look at our null and our alternate, so you have to stay with the null hypothesis unless your data is significant enough to reject the null and then that would give data supporting the alternate. But you're stuck in the null until you can reject it. Because our test statistic was further in the tail than our critical value, we have enough to reject the null so the data is significant to show that the actual population average of the cups of coffee from this dispenser is now different from seven ounces. Now because we just did the hypothesis test with the not equal to, we can only state it that way. If we're like, well yeah, but it looks like it's bigger, well then we would need to do a different test where in our situation we do our null that mu is equal to 7 and our alternate would be that mu is greater than 7. But that's not what they asked here. So I can only provide sufficient evidence for what it was that I had in the alternate in the test they asked me to do. So for our fourth step, we usually have us write out a sentence. Our sentence would start with, reject the null at the 5% level of significance. Our data indicates that the average amount of coffee per cup is now different from our 7 ounces at the 5% level of significance.